If you know the story, you know that there was great anticipation when Saul began his career as the Israel's first king. The patchwork confederacy of Israel that had proven to be administratively ineffective and a moral disaster um, was shown in the repetition of the refrain, two uh, repetitions of it in the book of Judges that captured the situation. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know, as you read the story, Paul's initial or Saul, rather, his, his initial reluctance to, um, to accept that role as king, uh, at first seemed to portend a sign of good. After all, who wouldn't want a king that was humble? But whatever the source of Saul's reluctance to take that role, it seems it was not humility. He soon became a jealous tyrant, fearing the gifts of David, eventually turning on and killing even the priests of God because they, without knowing that it would anger Saul, had prayed for King or, uh, uh, David, not king yet. And, and it soon became clear that it was God's will that David would be king, but not quite yet. David must break no law, must not lift up his hand against God's anointed king. Although he often received counsel and encouragement to do so, he refused. But in the course of time, God brought about a change in that administration. I want to read to you today uh, from First Chronicles, over three chapters. I'm not going to read all the chapters. I'm going to read a bit of uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, in chapter 12, and I want to focus in on the last verse of chapter 12. Now, the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons. They killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the Archers overtook him, they wounded him. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it, so Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died. So Saul and his three sons died, and all his house died together. And then chapter 11. All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, he made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel, as the Lord had promised through Samuel. And then chapter 12. These were the men who came to David at Ziglag while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who helped him in battle. And then I want to go to verse 32. The men of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Father, we pray today that you would bless the reading of your word, that you would bless our prayers and our praise, our singing. And Father, as we find ourselves uh, in a, a time of great inflection, we pray that you would Make us, like the men of Issachar, to be those who understood the times, would know what the church should do. Bless us in it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So They did, you know, the men of Issachar, they understood the times. They knew what Israel, what the church should do. And they understood the times not from a right-in-their-own-eyes perspective, but rather they understood it as an inflection point in history in the light of 
God's perspective and his revelation. On June 24th, in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson, the Supreme Court of the United States effectively overturned the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973. Perhaps it's because I'm not a lawyer, but I could never follow the law or the logic or the history on which Roe stood. When Roe ruled the right of abortion as a constitutional guarantee, there was great anticipation. Because women are often pressured into consenting to sex, but they really have no choice. Many of Jeffrey Epstein's victims, by the way, were consenting adults. And the promise of Roe was that women, often consenting under duress, would not now, in addition, have to endure an unwanted pregnancy and birth, and perhaps the pain of giving up a child that they'd carried to term, while the man responsible for her pregnancy walked away scot-free or perhaps paid a little bit of money. But as with King Saul, the anticipation of Roe was overpromised and underdelivered. Now women who were coerced into consenting to sex that they didn't really want often came to be coerced into having abortions that they didn't really want. Understanding the times as the men of Issachar did it requires, I think, two things requires understanding the facts, things as they really are, and it requires understanding the truth, the facts from God's perspective. And for us, I think, understanding the times will require knowing and understanding that there's not really an easily discernible side in this. You know, the mythology that you often uh, hear stated in the Christian media, sometimes hear it in the mainstream media, is that Churches oppose abortion, secularists endorse it. People who think that need to get out more. If I had to judge just by my own street, cars can't go faster than 40 miles an hour. They ought not go that fast on my street, but that's about the top limit. Increasingly, you find evangelical churches in support of a woman's right to choose, of abortion. There's a whole host of reasons why they do so. For some of them, it's a capitulation to the culture. It's just hard to be on the outs with the dominant culture all the time. For some of them, it's a repentance of their Pharisaic standing on principle without any compassion for the situations that women found themselves in, in a crisis pregnancy, and having an aha moment We've not reflected the compassion of Christ. The situation is further confused by the fact that there are many secularists who oppose abortion. I've been pleasantly surprised at the coverage in the mainstream media of this issue. I've seen them uh, interview people on both sides and actually let them talk. And I was surprised leading up to the decision that was anticipated, there was demonstration on both sides going on near the Supreme Court, and I saw it, and perhaps you did too, that as abortion proponents and opponents gathered outside the Supreme Court, there was one woman holding a sign, did you see it? It said, atheist, feminist, pro-life. There was another that read LGBTQ+, for life. There's not an easily discernible side on the issue. There are people who identify as Christians who support abortion, and there are atheists, some with a serious dislike for the Christian faith, who oppose abortion. So is the Dobbs decision a good decision or a bad one? How can we answer that? We can't say this is what Christians believe because what they believe varies. I think we need to ask an ought question. What ought Christians 
to think about abortion? What should they believe? And to answer that question, I want to lay some ground rules. If we're talking about the Christian faith and we're uh, talking about people of the book, people who believe the Bible. And so let me point out two passages that I think are uh, unambiguous. They don't require us to do any theology to draw any conclusions, but simply to listen to the words. The one is from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That God said, let us make mankind in our image and after our likeness. And we're told that God created man in the image of God. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I think I'm just restating the words, not drawing a conclusion, to say that the Bible teaches that human beings, every one of us, every one of you, men and women, are created in the image of God. And the second th that I want to point out is that the Bible views as an egregious crime the intentional taking of innocent human life. That is, human life that's guilty of no crime for the very reason that people are made in the image of God. In Genesis 9, 6, we read, If man sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God created man. So people are created in the image of God. God is displeased when innocent human life is taken because people are created in the image of God. The only question then is, when does human life begin? So I want to make a proposition to you today, and the proposition is this. Life begins at conception. Now let me tell you that life begins at conception as a proposition is a scientific, not a theological, conclusion. Throughout its history, the church has always been interested in the question of when life begins. Before the scientific revolution of the 16th century, conclusions about most things were drawn theologically from what the words seem to say to me, right? And, and, and then our own, uh, I'll call them perhaps naive experiences. So I did this with my Sunday school class today. Everybody stay still for just one moment. You feel the ground moving? No? See, obviously, the earth is set on foundations. Obviously, the earth is fixed, and it does not move, and the sun and the moon go. It's just obvious, right? It's common sense. When does human life begin? You know, historically, the church has provided a variety of theological answers to that. One of those answers is when the baby takes its first breath. Why do they think that? Well, because Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. When does life begin? When the first breath is taken. When respiration begins. I remember when my older daughter was uh, born and the, and the nurse caught her. That child was so purple, I thought that the nurse was holding an internal organ. I was, I was like, put it back. What, something's wrong here. And, and, and then all of a sudden, she breathed and became pink. And you're instantly discernible as a child. And the church has thought various times, given the answer that life begins at the first breath. Another answer the church has given theologically is at quickening. That is, when the mother feels the baby move in her womb. Among some medieval theologians, it was held that that was when a human soul entered the body, when, when you could feel the baby move. It's a very Platonic idea. It's the Bible read through Plato. But, um, but that's what they thought. Before that time, the fetus was regarded as a potential life. Or some people have thought, well, at the, at the stage of development that the uh, fetus becomes human. In other words, in other words there's, a, there's some place in the stage of the fetal development that the fetus becomes human. That's when human life begins. That's not a medieval idea. That idea goes back to the early 1970s. And Dr. Uh, Norman Geisler, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, who thought that before that time, um, 
fetuses in the womb weren't quite human. But why, why do they think that? Well, because they read some words and they drew conclusions. But while historically theology has debated the answer to the question, when exactly does human life begin? Science has given us an answer definitively to it. We now have scans, ultrasound scans, 4D, 5D scans. Have you ever seen some of this technology? It's unbelievable what you can see. And we know that long before quickening takes place, that is that the mother can feel the baby moving around in the womb, babies suck their thumbs, they play with their toes, And we have uh, unraveled with the Human Genome Project the mysteries, or most of them, or we think most of them, of uh, DNA. DNA is produced only in living things. It's produced in people, it's produced in animals, it's produced in plants. Rocks don't have DNA. And the DNA of a fetus at any stage of development is never anything other than a human DNA from the moment of conception. And the other thing that we know is that the DNA of the embryo from the moment of conception is different, distinct, and separate from that of the mother. It's not a part of the mother. It's not the mother's cells. And going by just the words of scripture and uh, the naive idea, well, it seems to me, and my common sense observation, that the church has debated at what point life begins, but science has allowed us to see inside the womb and to examine the building blocks of human existence. There, there just really is no debate about it anymore. Life begins at conception. The life that begins at conception is separate from the mother's life, dependent on the mother, but separate from the mother's life. And that life is never anything other than a human life. And so then we go back to the words of Scripture. For God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. If anyone shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God created man. I think it's significant to consider that even before the church or anyone really knew definitively when human life began, from the earliest the church had opposed abortion in a work called the Didache, which dates from about the year 100. It's the, it's the earliest uh, manual of kind of church practice and practical doctrine. In, in chapter 2 it says, you shall not murder a child by abortion or kill that which is born. So it's significant, I think, to consider that from the earliest time, uh, even when there was debate about when life began exactly, that, that, that the church had this opposition to abortion. I think it's important, too, that we understand, and I think probably most of you do today, at first when this happened, it seemed to me there was more confusion right after June 24th, that the Supreme Court decision does not make abortion <coughs> illegal. Um, despite the gleeful victory dances of the abortion opponents and the apocalyptic groans of the abortion proponents, abortion is not illegal in the United States. And without a national change of heart, the court's decision is tenuous, and I predict that its effects will be temporary. I have long prayed for the day when the decision of 1973, the Roe decision, would be overturned. But I prayed that it would be overturned because of the grace of God awakening a sense of humanity in us all when people would look at the practice and they would conclude, oh God, what have we done? The polls indicate that a majority of Americans disagree strongly with the Supreme Court decision. You know, prohibition, the total prohibition of alcohol came about through a legislative rather than a judicial process, but it's a good parallel. 
Prohibition, regardless of what you might think of it, did not last long because the majority of people did not want it. And the effect of the Dobbs decision will last about as long as prohibition if hearts do not change. Which leads us to the last two things I think we need to consider to know, to rightly understand the times that we live in and and what the church ought to do. The, The history of how we ended up with Roe in the first place ought to open our eyes to the fact that the kingdom of God is not of this world. Those were the words of Jesus to Pontius Pilate. The kingdom of God does not have its origin from here. It doesn't gain its authority from here. The kingdom of God is not of this world. Roe had a prehistory. The first laws allowing abortion in the U.S. were passed in New York State. The legislation was in, in, uh, introduced by a female Republican state representative, was passed by a Republican legislature, and signed into law by a Republican governor. The ardent opposition to it by Democrats, mostly working class Catholics, is what kicked off the national debate that ended in Roe versus Wade. So let me say bluntly here, that the Republican Party has no part in the kingdom of God, nor does the Democratic Party. Don't make the mistake when earthly kingdoms superficially and temporarily mimic the kingdom of God of confusing them with God's kingdom. No matter how handsome Caesar may look to you at the moment, Christians can never swear allegiance to him as Lord. Christ alone is Lord. Now, does that mean that that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics or even work in politics? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that you should always remember that you are Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's court and never become one of the Babylonian soothsayers. The goal of political parties in case you've missed it recently, is to stay in power. And they would sell their rancid and emaciated souls to do so. Don't you sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. And the second is to face the situation that we have, the opportunity that we have now, with the compassion of Jesus. You know, maybe it's due to fear. I don't know why. Fear that if we recognize, but I see it in the church a lot, fear that if we recognize a problem that others have highlighted, that we then must embrace their solution. And so the way to deal with it then is just to deny that there's really a problem. And in so doing, we alienate everyone who suffers from that problem. In the days after June 4th, I listen deliberately to interviews with women on news stations that I don't usually listen to. Why did I do that, by the way? Because the book of Proverbs accounts as a fool, someone who listens only to one side of an issue. And so I listened to interviews with uh, women who were affected, they believed, adversely by this decision. And they were genuinely frightened. Why? Well, some of it was theoretical. Some of the women they spoke to were not uh, pregnant, probably would not become pregnant, but they were afraid. Why were they afraid? Because for two generations, right, as somebody who is in their uh, early 50s or younger than that, for their entire lives, they've been told that their right to choose is a constitutional guarantee. And now all of a sudden, it's taken away. I don't really care what you think of that, whether you think it should have been or whatnot. That's what they were told. And the court's decision hit these women with the emotional force that NRA members would be hit with if a future court ruled that the Second Amendment didn't really guarantee an individual right that it was to be regulated by the states now. Some of that fear was actual. This didn't happen until later, but unless you've been uh, you know, in, a, in, in a closet and hiding somewhere, 
You know about that tragic story of that 10-year-old girl impregnated by an incestuous rape um, whose, whose body shouldn't have been able to conceive but certainly can't handle the rig rigors of pregnancy and a delivery. Or a 14-year-old girl who was pressured by her 14-year-old boyfriend to have sex. And she consented. He didn't, he didn't force her in any physical way. He just kept up the verbal pressure until she consented and became pregnant as a result. As a minor young man, he walks away scot-free. She has to carry the result to term and then either give up the baby her immature body labored to bring forth or raise the baby as a single mother in what will undoubtedly be squalid conditions. She comes from a poor family. And this uh, girl was on the radio. Um, I think they wouldn't have probably interviewed her on television. You know, cried and said, how is that fair? And the attitude of the Pharisees would say, well, buck up, it's your own problem. But the compassion of Jesus says it's not fair. It's not fair. Another pregnant woman interviewed had lived in a consensual relationship. It was a consensual relationship. Sex was the price for her having a roof over her head. And being pregnant now, she'll likely be kicked out. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18 with regard to the Dobbs decision. It says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles lest the Lord see and be displeased and he turns away his anger from him. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, um, the wife of a pastor I've known, it's a couple that I've known since I was in college, posted a gloating little dig. She said, wow, imagine being upset now that babies get to live. And, and you know, I, I talked to her about that. I said, you know, nobody's upset that babies get to live. Some people are upset because they believe they're being deprived of a constitutional right. Most women who go for an abortion do so with great mourning. You know, people who take their own lives, they don't do so gleefully. They do so because they think that it's the best terrible choice of a host of terrible choices. And women don't abort their babies gleefully. They do it because they think it's the best terrible choice of a bunch of terrible choices. Now, let me tell you that in both cases, they're wrong. It's not the best choice. But what's the effect? of posting something like that. Oh, imagine being upset now that babies get to live. What's the effect of posting something like that, doing a, a gloating little victory dance? So the woman who is in a crisis pregnancy and is, af and is afraid, such a post says, serves you right. Because you're the other, you're the pariah, you're the one, even if they'd never say this, with their words, you're the one who isn't welcome here. Don't you dare walk through the doors of my church. So if you're one who takes delight in gloating over the downfall of Roe, make your posts and get your satisfaction while you can because it's not going to last long. But if in this time of tenuous pro-life victory, Christian people shame and mock and drive away from the church women who are in need. Well, those who are working night and day to vacate the force of the Dobbs decision will be there to receive them. And people will embrace the wrong solution offered to them with compassion if the right solution is offered with mocking and contempt and gloating. Roe began its reign in 1973 to great anticipation. This was going to be the solution or a solution. The patchwork of state laws that preceded it were ineffective and morally disastrous in providing any help to women in need, and Roe was, it was going to be the solution. But Roe became a tyrant. To the coercion of women to have sex was now added the coercion of women to have abortions. And Roe would lead further to the hatred and suppression 
of anyone who offered another solution. If you don't believe that, talk to my friend Nikki Madsen at Mosaic. In God's providence, things have changed. And it is God's providence. For how long they will change depends now, I believe, in large part on what Christian people do. Christian people waste the opportunity by doing gloating little victory dances. The change will not last long. But if Christian people are like the men of Issachar, who truly understand the times and know what must be done, if we recognize that the situation is tenuous, we seek with wisdom to make the most of every opportunity. If we refrain from gloating so as to not drive away those in need and we can look on women in need with the compassion of Jesus and say, look, I know you're afraid. I know you feel like rights and options have been taken away from you. I know it's not fair. I know that you don't know what in the world you're going to do now. But come with us. We have resources. We have people who can and will help. We'll show you unconditional love and we'll share with you the love of God in Jesus Christ and we'll tell you that message as often as you'll hear it from us, but it's no condition for the love that we'll show to you. We care about your life, not just the life of your baby. And God is our witness. We will not let you fall. June 24 was not the day I prayed for because nothing changed but the interpretation of the law. And law never saved anyone. But if we understand the times, if we behave with the compassion of Jesus, it may be the change that I'd hoped for because people will change. And the day that I pray for, the day that I hope you pray for, may yet dawn. God, give us wisdom and grace. Father, in your providence, uh, you have presented us with this opportunity. And that's what it is, Lord. It's an opportunity. It's not a victory. And so, Father, help us, as your word says, to redeem the time, to make the most of the opportunity that you've given to us. Uh, Father, to refrain from uh, gloating. And Father, to truly open our eyes to see the kingdom of God and hold out the, the love and the care, the concern, the healing of Jesus to those who are in need. And Father, bring about, bring about, we pray through the action of your church a true and lasting change because it's a change of heart and we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.